Amid the vast and untamed wilderness of the Cascade Mountains, a story unfolded that would remain etched in the memories of those who heard it. It was the summer of 1974 when the Fitzgerald family ventured deep into a remote Forest Service campground, seeking solitude and adventure. The family, led by Steve, a hard-working bulldozer operator, and his wife Jean, brought along their two children, Dan, a teenager of 16 with a burgeoning sense of independence, and Gloria, a spirited nine-year-old. This journey was meant to be a peaceful escape into nature, but what they encountered would turn their vacation into an unforgettable tale. All are experienced campers and mountain country hikers. Steve was working on a mining claim not far from the campground and commuted to in from the trailer. At first, the family heard unusual noises late at night, but thought nothing about it. Probably a bear was prowling around. Several days later, while Steve was at work and the children pulling a small raft on a lake beside the campground, Jean sat outside to read a newspaper. A Stellar's J made such a racket that she looked up. Standing motionless amidst the tall Douglas firs was a huge, black-haired, ape-like creature. It was staring at her. Although alarmed, Jean stared back until it finally walked off into the forest. Most women would have called their children and fled the scene. Not Jean, nor her children. They stayed, talked excitedly about it, and told Steve when he returned from work. Steve was positive his wife had seen a bear. Jean, an experienced fisherwoman and hunter, insisted she had not. Besides, the family vacation was not going to be cut short for any reason. However, that same night, two creatures were observed in the bright moonlight. The family was in bed, but not yet asleep when they heard the familiar thumping noises, like an elephant clumping around. They peered out the windows by their bunks and saw a male and female Bigfoot. The family whispered excitedly, giggled and clung to each other, more thrilled than frightened. Again, they were all much too curious to think of quitting the area. The next afternoon, Jean sent Danto a spring near the trailer. She was going to make lemonade and wanted fresh cold water. Dan took a kettle and walked a well-marked trail through the tree's tove spring. On his way back, one of the creatures stepped out from behind the tree and followed him. Gloria saw the Bigfoot and screamed. Jean dashed from the trailer. The moment she appeared, the creature vanished. After mother and children recovered from their momentary fright, they realized that on none of the previous sightings had Bigfoot made any threatening moves. Apparently, the Bigfoot was as curious about them as they were about it. Nevertheless, Jean wanted to leave. It was the children who begged to stay. They couldn't wait to see Bigfoot again. Their father assented. But for the remainder of the vacation, he hung a lighted lantern at night in the tree nearest the trailer. Bigfoot returned several times, usually at night in the waning moonlight. Occasionally, it was seen briefly in the daytime, but only during midweek when there were no other outfits parked in the campground. Although the parents and children are friendly and outgoing, none alerted other campers to the visiting the area. Even though they knew the use of firearms in a U.S. Forest Service campground is prohibited, they did not want throngs of armed men disrupting the peaceful scene. Meanwhile, the children nicknamed the male creature Johnny and joked about his ugly appearance. They prevailed upon their mother to leave food on the picnic table, hoping it would draw the creature closer. None of the fruit or candy was touched. Then, shortly before the family was to return to town, Steve and Jean were gathering firewood within sight of the trailer. Suddenly, Jean became aware of a very disagreeable odor. Moments later, when reaching for a piece of wood, she found herself face to face with the creature. She screamed and fainted. On returning home, the family told their friends about the experience. Someone told a newspaper reporter, and shortly after a feature appeared in the local newspaper. Portland newspapers and other big city publications picked it up with the result that readers all over the country knew of the unusual happening. Becoming overnight celebrities was exciting for a while, but also took its toll. The family found itself almost buried under an avalanche of mail, telephone calls, radio and television interviews, and strangers knocking on the door at all hours. 
somehow they survived. In time, Steve and the children resumed a fairly normal schedule. Not Jean. By this time, she was almost wholly occupied with the question of Bigfoot's existence, and what she felt was the real need to provide protection for the creatures. Since that August of 1974, she has returned to the mountains several times a week, except when deep snowfall prohibits travel. Often alone or with Dan, this extraordinary woman walks the trails quietly and spends hours waiting for a Bigfoot to appear. She carries no weapon and only recently began to carry a camera. The family continues to camp and hike in the remote areas of the Cascades. Jean has guided a few earnest searchers through her area and on a few occasions has shared their excitement on seeing a Bigfoot. The Fitzgeralds do not want publicity, nor does Jean expect to profit from her dogged search. Her primary goal is to earn the creature's trust so that it will come closer and closer and finally take food from her hand. When this happens, and hopefully is recorded on film, she feels she will have proof to non-believers and scientists everywhere that the Bigfoot is worthy of serious scientific investigation and protection from hunters driven by greed. The story of the Flathead Lake incident in the early 1900s offers a fascinating glimpse into one of Montana's earliest recorded Bigfoot sightings, intertwined with the rich tapestry of Native American folklore. This tale unfolds on the rugged terrain surrounding Flathead Lake, a region steeped in mystery and natural beauty. According to local legends, the Salish and Kootenai tribes, who have inhabited the area for centuries, spoke of a large, elusive creature living in the dense forests. This creature was not just a figment of imagination, but a part of their cultural narrative, woven into stories passed down through generations. These tales described the creature as a formidable presence in the woods, a being that was to be respected and perhaps feared. The specific sighting in question occurred during the early 1900s when a group of loggers set up camp near Flathead Lake. At that time, logging was a grueling profession, demanding not only physical strength, but also mental endurance, as workers spent weeks in the remote wilderness, far from civilization. One evening, after a long day of labor, the men gathered around their campfire, recounting the day's efforts and sharing stories. As the night grew darker, a sense of unease settled over them. The typical sounds of the forest, rustling leaves, distant animal calls, seemed amplified, almost as if something or someone was watching. Suddenly they spotted a massive figure moving swiftly through the trees, just beyond the glow of their fire. At first, they thought it might be a bear, common in the region, but the creature's gait was upright, its movements eerily human. As it came closer, they could see it was covered in dark, matted hair. The air was thick with a foul odor, described by the loggers as a mix of rotting flesh and skunk. A stench so overpowering, it made their eyes water and their stomachs churn. One of the braver loggers, armed with a lantern and an axe, decided to get a closer look. As he approached, the creature let out a low, guttural growl that reverberated through the trees. The man stopped in his tracks, his heart pounding. The creature's eyes glowed faintly in the dim light, suggesting intelligence and perhaps even curiosity. For a moment, man and beast stood still, locked in a silent standoff. Then, as quickly as it had appeared, the creature turned and vanished into the darkness, leaving behind only broken branches and a lingering smell. The loggers were left shaken, their minds racing to comprehend what they had witnessed. They debated the identity of the creature late into the night, with some insisting it was a bear or a large ape, while others believed they had encountered the legendary big man of the forest. This sighting soon became the talk of the nearby towns, adding a new chapter to the region's folklore. Over the years, the story of the Flathead Lake incident has been recounted by the elders of the Flathead Indian Reservation, often with a mix of awe and reverence. They see it as a reminder of the mysteries that still linger in the wild places of the earth, a symbol of the unknown that continues to captivate the human imagination. References to this event can occasionally be found in local history books and folklore collections, such as Montana Legends by J.D. McCulloch, where it serves as a testament to the enduring power of oral traditions and the allure of the unexplained. Montana, Nevada, and Utah 
Sightings, new and old sightings. Montana, well known as Big Sky Country, has millions of acres of forests, rocky mountains, and alpine meadows which support large herds of elk and deer. It is still home to the scarce mountain sheep and mountain goat and bears, including the fearsome grizzly. Only recently, however, have reports of Bigfoot sightings originated there. Beginning in 1973, local newspapers printed accounts of sightings made by loggers, university students hiking in the mountains, and townspeople who venture out before snowfall to cut a winter's supply of firewood. All the descriptions tally closely with those of creatures seen in the Pacific Northwest. One story is worth recounting because of its special message. In September 1974, a party of five university students set out to hike on St. Mary's Peak, 30 miles west of Missoula in the Bitterroot Mountains. Since there are a number of marked trails leading to the summit, and the pitch of each trail varies from moderate to steep, the hikers split up. Two of the young men headed straight for the top. The third, because of a recent knee operation, set a less strenuous pace on an easier trail. Two female companions straggled along behind him, talking and gathering frost-burnished leaves for an art project. It was mid-afternoon when Chris Tobias turned off the trail to rest his throbbing knee. He sat on a rocky ledge which gave him a beautiful view of the mountainside. Shortly after, he spied two figures emerge from the trees below him. He knew these could not be his male friends, and he was not overly curious because the peak is a favorite place for hikers. He couldn't help thinking that if it was hunting season, due to open in two weeks, he was in a superb position to shoot a deer. He continued to watch the figures idly until the hair on the back of his neck bristled. The figures were moving along a ridge, coming toward him at a pace much too swift for the average human. As they came closer, he saw they were not human beings, but huge black-haired animals walking upright in a superbly smooth, gliding stride. The creatures were less than a hundred yards away when they veered suddenly out of sight, descending a tight, deep, and shadowy ravine. By the time his heart stopped pounding and he realized he had seen two Bigfoot creatures, he was joined by the women hikers. One exclaimed, Chris, we saw something really weird walking along that ridge below you. Diane Stringen added, At first I thought it was Bob and Dick coming down from the summit. Then I realized the two were much larger and dressed differently. And then, Kathy Mudd interrupted excitedly, we saw they were hairy all over. They weren't human. They were those Bigfoot creatures we've read about and thought were a bunch of nonsense, Diane admitted. About that time, the remaining members of their party arrived. After comparing notes, all were thankful they weren't carrying guns that day. The men all said they would have been tempted to shoot first and think second. In the flickering light of sun and shadow on the trail, they could have injured or killed a friend. Such tragedies were all too common in the woods. Now for the message. As reports of Bigfoot sightings crop up in so many areas, thoughtless gun-happy searchers appear in droves. Thus, hunting season or not, it would be wise to wear a brightly colored hat or shirt whenever one searches for the Bigfoot. Only one other Montana sighting will be mentioned. 16-year-old Robert Lee lives on a farm situated at the base of mountains west of Helena, the state capital. On April 4, 1976, he wakened about daylight and looked out the window of his second-story bedroom. He saw a large, hairy creature striding across the pasture adjacent to the house. Grabbing binoculars from a desk, he focused on the creature as it walked toward a haystack. He saw that except for the face, hands, and feet, it was covered with black hair and appeared to be about eight feet tall. The creature seemed to have no neck, the forehead was slanted, the nose flat, and the jaw protruding. The eyes and head turned constantly in the same manner a coyote does while crossing hostile territory. When the creature reached the haystack some 150 yards from his window, a second one stepped into view. It was slightly shorter, but otherwise looked the same. At this point, young Lee raced downstairs to waken his father. By the time the two returned to a window, the creatures had disappeared into the forest surrounding the farm. The father called the sheriff's office. When two deputies arrived, they found huge footprints by the haystack. These measured 17% inches long, 7 inches wide across the ball of the foot, and showed three distinct toe marks. Young Lee and his sister made a plaster cast of the best track. Later in the day, he was interviewed by newsmen and others from the sheriff's office. 
From the latter, he learned that similar sightings in the county had been reported in the previous year and a half. Some of those reporting had demanded they be given lie detector tests to prove they were telling the truth. The tests indicated they were. One of the lawmen told a reporter for the Great Falls Tribune, so far, none of the Bigfoots had made any move to harm a human. One witness admitted firing a shot at a creature, but missed. We urge people not to shoot at them with guns, but with cameras. If possible, we'd like to take one alive to study it. As of November 1977, the sightings were continuing. So far, Bigfoot has not been at all cooperative in standing still long enough to be photographed, let alone captured alive. People are still arguing about why the Bigfoot creatures are being seen where they were not known to exist previously. The mountains surrounding Helena are not all that rugged, and few areas are free of loggers, campers, birdwatchers, and hikers. None who have sighted Bigfoot know each other, nor are their homes close by. And most important, none of the sightings reported smacked of any attempts to perpetrate a hoax. If you check a map and see that sightings have been made in California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and now Montana, what about Nevada and Utah? Nevada, by digging through the files of Nevada newspapers, you learn there are numerous stories about the so-called Wild Man of Tioga, the Lundy Monster, and the Sierra Bigfoot. These date from the 1890s up to the present. While much of Nevada is open country where a Bigfoot would be hard put to hide, the settlements close to or on the east slope of the Sierra Nevada moon. Tawnies do offer some forest cover that has not been stripped by logging or mining, and a maze of small deep ravines and gulches watered by creeks. The Virginia City Evening Chronicle published on April 9, 1890, a news item which had appeared earlier in the Homer Index, a smaller publication. The editor of the latter was widely known by a fitting nickname, that of W.E. Lying Jim Townsend. Readers enjoyed his style of reporting, whether he was recording facts or spinning a tale that was pure fiction. Here is one of his stories. The terror of tourists was seen near Lundy. The wild man, whom several parties have attempted to capture during the past 10 years, was encountered in Vining Creek Canyon last week by John Forsey, who describes him as of giant size and fierce aspect. John met the king of the wilderness, as he used to be called, almost face to face, and had time to survey him before he took flight over the frozen snow at a speed which defied pursuit, which John was not disposed to engage in. The man was clad from head to foot in coyote skins and wore round Indian snowshoes. Though apparently quite aged, his hair and beard being white, he was as agile as a deer and climbed the steep side of the canyon with incredible swiftness. It is some years since we heard of this wild creature being seen, but he is doubtless the same who terrorized tourists in the early part of the present decade. Then he distinguished himself by snatching a young lady from a mule in the presence of her companions and then disappearing in the thick timber at the southwestern base of Mount Dana, displaying Herculean strength and wonderful agility. She was found by a search party next day in a half-minted condition, unable to give a lucid account of her experience. No trace of her abductor could be discovered. His habitat is gorges in that vicinity, from which he emerges when pressed by hunger or by stress of weather. It is supposed by many that he is some unfortunate prospector who became graced by hardship and has been forgotten by all who ever knew him. It is known, however, that he is of gigantic stature and has superhuman strength. Surprisingly, many modern-day searchers not only accept this tale as fact and state positively that the wild man was really Bigfoot. Bigfoot buffs believe in the existence then and now of the Sierra Bigfoot. One told the author, why not? What's different from our sightings than those of Sasquatch or Bigfoot in Washington and Oregon? There probably were some old coots who went crazy searching for gold and scared folks when they showed up at a store to buy beans and tobacco. But not every sighting was that of an adulpated human. There's plenty of us who believe the real Bigfoot is up in those mountains. Where? Well, you don't think we are going to tell you, do you? Who wants an army of gun-carrying nuts making trouble? Utah, meanwhile.
Hunters in Utah reported that as of August and September 1977, Bigfoot was alive and, well, statements were made by two men from North Ogden, Jay Barker and Larry Beeson, about the experience they and their young sons and two teenage friends had while hiking along a ridge between Pass Lake and Kew Brant Basin, near the head of the Weber River drainage, all stocked to rest, and were looking down on a small hidden lake when they saw the creature at the edge of the water. It was very tall, maybe 10 feet tall, and covered with white hair over its shoulders and halfway down its body. One of the teenagers pitched a rock at it. The creature turned, looked up, and quickly disappeared into the surrounding trees. Since the two fathers had not heard of John Green and his associates' efforts to authenticate Bigfoot sightings in the Northwest, they called on friends to do so. Unlike the mission, British Columbia, hoax, here was a sighting made by two adult men and six youngsters whose ages ranged from 14 to 5. One of the first persons called was an officer for the northern region of the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. He stated the creature very likely was not a grizzly bear, as some would say later. Grizzlies were extremely rare in Utah, unless one had migrated hundreds of miles south from the Yellowstone National Park wilderness. Jay Barker, one of the two fathers, is an experienced hunter. He realized immediately that he was not looking down on an elk or a grizzly. When he saw it standing on two legs and then walking in man-like movements, he was dumbfounded. Its actions were also very unlike those of any kind of bear. As soon as a responsible hunting party could be organized, Jerry Dahlberg, conservation officer for the State Wildlife Group, led a party into the wilderness area. We covered a lot of country some extremely primitive and rugged, and from what we could tell, never before really penetrated by man. Although no concrete evidence was turned up, the officer was not about to write off the sighting. For one thing, he said, if such a creature is in that area, it would be on the move for food, not staying in one place for any length of time. Otherwise, they would have found droppings, rocks overturned in a search for grubs, torn tree bark, even animal carcasses. But nothing of this nature was encountered. Dahlberg continued, There are just miles and miles of wilderness on the upper Weber River. Not many people go into the region because there is little or no fishing, and the terrain is just too rugged. Apparently the country isn't too rugged for Bigfoot. Actually, it might be one of the few places left in the West where the creatures could find reasonably safe sanctuary. Thanks for watching Bigfoot Encounters, Mysterious Sightings in the Western Wilderness. If you enjoyed exploring these strange sightings with me, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe. It really helps support the channel and keeps the search for Bigfoot alive. See you in the next one.